And I now invite Professor Tipler to close the debate as a whole. I notice, ladies and gentlemen, that in this house, science will have the final say. <coughs> um, I want to argue that science can indeed answer uh, the biggest questions, and my only disagreement with my colleagues on the opposition side is they have not been aggressive enough in defending science. Myself, I am a physics imperialist. We physicists are ultimately going to take over the intellectual world. <laughs> And I want to argue that science can indeed answer the biggest questions, and not only can, but has. And let's start with what are the biggest questions. Immanuel Kant said these are the three biggest questions of metaphysics. Does God exist? Do we have libertarian free will? Is there life after death? I claim science has answered those questions. Yes, yes, and yes, ladies and gentlemen. Let me briefly describe how the answers work. Now I'm going to have to use, I apologize for this, a teeny bit technical language, but um, if you want to get the details of that, well, you can look up the physics literature, and I advise you to do that, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, well, does God exist? I have already said yes. What is God? God, I claim, is a supernatural being that created the universe out of nothing. I hope you will accept this definition of God. What is supernatural? Supernatural means literally outside of nature. Um, created means, well, determining the whole structure of the physical universe. God, thus defined, is actually the cosmological singularity whose existence has been demonstrated by uh, science. And it's supernatural because the singularity is not in space and time. It's outside, in other words, of nature. Out of nothing, there is nothing besides the singularity and the universe which it's created. Okay, that's one big question. Let's take on another one. <laughs> Do we have... Thank you. Do we have libertarian free will? Well, the, Ox the um, Princeton philosopher, um, David Lewis, wrote a book, fascinating book, I recommend you all read it, um, Plurality of Worlds. He argued, how do we really know that given a choice between A and B, that when we choose A, that we really had the choice of choosing B. He said the only way we could really be certain that we can do something is if we actually do it. Here I am standing in front of you. It's therefore possible for me to stand in front of you. I'm doing it. But perhaps I decided not to come here, in which case I would not do that. But how do I know I actually had the power not to come here? Lewis said the only way we could say definitely I had the power not to come here is that, that there's a universe out there, every bit as real as this one, in which I do not come to the Oxford Union to describe this. Um, now, remarkably, science has demonstrated the existence of these parallel worlds, the um, universes, which are every bit as real as us. You can talk to the uh, Oxford University Quantum Group. I will recommend Professor David Deutsch, who's an expert on this. Um, and I was going to present the experimental evidence today. It was an unfortunate mix-up in the um, setting of the uh, seminar, so I didn't get to do it. But the experimental evidence showing these other worlds exist actually has now um, been released. Okay, is there life after death? Of course, yes, there's life after death. How? Well, I'm claiming science will increase the power of the human race and our descendants so that in the far future, there will be computers of sufficient power that every one of us and every one of us who has ever existed can you be emulated, that's an exact copy, in the computers of the far future, never to die again. So we've got uh, <laughs> life after death, we've got free will, and God exists. Those are the three biggest questions according to Immanuel Kant, but I'm not going to stop here. Why is there something rather than nothing? Because the singularity, created the universe. All right, other big questions. Does the universe have a purpose? Do the human race have a purpose? Do each one of us have an individual purpose? You know my answers. Yes, yes, and yes. 
Okay, let's take the universe. Now here I'm, going to, I'm afraid I'm going to have to be a teeny bit technical. Bear with me. You physicists will know what I'm talking about. Others of you, you are thereby encouraged to learn some serious physics, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the universe, the wave function, which is not a probability amplitude, but a um, relative density of the universe is uh, in the multiverse amplitude, has unitary time evolution. Now, you've never heard these technical terms before, but let me describe roughly what it is. Um, unitary time evolution means you usually think of cause and effect as working from past to future. Unitarity shows that you can think in the opposite direction, that what happens today is actually determined by the ultimate state of the universe. So why are we um, doing what we're doing today? Because the ultimate goal of the universe has to have us doing this in order to achieve that. All right? Um, now, the, um, if you want details of how, what the final state actually is, uh, well, I can't do it in 10 minutes. Fortunately, I've written a book, The Physics of the Immortality, that describes it in some detail. Um, now, I want to argue the um, individual human life, um, like all metazoans, our purpose, believe it or not, is to give rise to our successors. Now, your parents took this attitude. Here you are. Um, now, I presume if you follow your duty, ladies and gentlemen, you will also, when you get older, also have children and continue um, the, uh, the tradition. Um, the human race as itself um, has a similar purpose, namely to give rise to our successor. Let me quote from the Bible of our side, um, um, Darwin's Origin of Species by means of natural selection. Very end, he says, no species now existing will transmit its unaltered likeness to a distant futurity. That's going to be the case. The human race will eventually die out and be replaced by a successor species, and our duty is to leave them with as much technology and knowledge as we can. Our predecessors, Homo erectus, Neander, uh, Homo neanderthalensis, left us with um, knowledge of how to work fire and uh, Paleolithic uh, technology. I'm hoping we're going to do better to our successors. Um, we already have, and I think that um, our successors will be artificial intelligences, AI. I expect them to arrive uh, roughly in this century, and I hope we will um, leave them with a superior world, um, and I think we shall. Okay, but why should we think ourselves morally obligated to do this. Ladies and gentlemen, we are told that uh, science can tell us nothing about ethics. I want to disagree with that too. I think you can get ethics from science also, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the reason is that science itself, in order to do science, you have to adopt certain ethical principles. What are these ethical principles? Well, one, you cannot fake experimental data. Thou shalt not bear false witness. <laughs> also, <laughs> thou shalt not impose your theories on everybody, anyone else by force. I'm trying to persuade you. I'm not pulling out a gun and say, accept my, my theory, I'll shoot you dead. No, not allowed. That's one ethical principle. The second ethical principle and thou shalt communicate to other rational beings the results of your scientific research. Now, in saying this, this is what is required in order to do science. Notice I'm not deriving um, an alt from an is. Rather, I'm saying in order to understand what an is is, you must adopt certain alts. That the Greeks understood this, that um, is and alts are not the same, but they are intimately intertwined. The Greeks knew that the good, the true, and the beautiful um, were not the same, but nevertheless, they knew they were intertwined. Science, in other words, can answer the big questions and has answered the big questions bigly. <laughs>